Joining us momentarily will be Liz Kozlov. Liz is an assistant professor of urban planning at UCLA's Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. Her work explores the social dimensions of climate change, questions on environmental and climate justice, questions about how cities are adapting to the effects of climate change, such as extreme weather and uh, sea level rise. She will be presenting on the human impact of climate change. Let's welcome Liz to the stage. Thank you, Thank you Karen. Thanks to Sum Thanks to Sumaya, oh, let me step here, and to all of the organizers for today. I don't know if I'm getting this because it's too close to my face. Let's see. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Terrific. In our classrooms when we teach at UCLA, we don't usually get this kind of high-tech equipment. So um, I'm glad that climate change's human impact is on the agenda today because it's certainly one of the most pressing global issues that we face. Um, you can look no further than the latest superstorm. Are you still getting feedback out there? Or is it just in my head? A little bit? OK. The latest superstorm, the mass mobilizations we've seen of young people who are walking out of school and taking to the streets to protest the kind of political inaction that threatens to leave them with an uninhabitable future. It's a very sobering topic, to be sure. And it's also one that is very hard to cover in 10 minutes. So I'm going to try to stick to my notes so I don't go over. But what I hope to leave you with in the short time that we have today is not just a sense of the daunting challenges we face, but also the kinds of movements and transformations that are already underway in response. So to start, I'm going to take you to a time and a place that I know best from my own research, and that's New York City after Hurricane Sandy. So as you can see up there, up there, in this image from NASA, you can see Hurricane Sandy approaching the East Coast the day before it made landfall on October 29th, 2012. So I was living in New York at the time. I was working on my PhD at NYU. And in the city, the borough of Staten Island was especially hard hit. Uh, neighborhoods like this one on Staten Island's east shore have suffered repeated flooding over the years. And my research seeks to understand what will happen to neighborhoods like this as climate change increases the risks that they've already faced. This graph likely looks familiar to many of you. It shows the unprecedented increase in average global temperatures, rising at an unprecedented rate, tracking the growing concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Even if the powers that be, if we all stopped burning fossil fuels and decarbonized today, carbon dioxide lingers in the atmosphere and continues to have a warming effect for upwards of a century after its release. So what this means is that even as we work to mitigate climate change by cutting fossil fuel emissions, we also need to work to adapt to the effects that are already locked in, enough to ensure substantial disruption to everyday life in many places. We can measure global warming and its effects on more local levels as well. So this shows uh, that average annual temperatures in New York City, as measured in Central Park, have increased 3.4 degrees Fahrenheit since 1900. By the time Sandy struck, there had already been one foot of sea level rise observed in New York City over the past century. Now one foot, it doesn't sound like much, but this extra foot of water is estimated to have added approximately $2 billion to Sandy's toll in the city and to have flooded an extra 75,000 people who would not have flooded in the absence of sea level rise. In New York Harbor, water is rising at more than double the global average rate. And this is a rate that's set to increase exponentially, such that the New York City Panel on Climate Change has estimated that what is today called the 100-year flood, so this is the flood with a 1% chance of occurring in any given year, could be more like the one in eight year flood by the 2080s, due solely to the rise in sea levels, without even factoring in the likelihood of more intense storms. What's clear is that it's no longer possible to take a stable climate or consistent environmental conditions for granted. So whether you're here today because you're primarily interested in migration, in racial and economic inequality, in conflict and war, in public health, in the health of democracy, Whatever the issue, the changing climate is a key context and force to consider with impacts that are increasingly difficult to ignore. And this is especially evident in cities. 
Worldwide, there are many coastal cities like New York, like Los Angeles, that are at risk from sea level rise. So the dots here you can see on this map show coastal cities of more than one million people. Despite this, coastal development continues to increase, putting more people, property, and infrastructure in harm's way. Now, of course, floods and storms are only some of the many risks that cities face from climate change. Heat waves, for instance, are far less visible, but already far more deadly. Yet Sandy, coming to New York so soon after Hurricane Irene, drove home just how vulnerable and failure-prone the city's infrastructure had become, from chronically under-maintained public housing to the subway tunnels that flooded and the power stations that failed, leaving even the city's wealthiest areas facing outages of their own. The fact that Sandy hit a major center of media, political, and economic power drove a surge of interest in how cities can adapt to extreme weather and sea level rise. Many agreed that it would be unwise to rebuild in the same way as before the storm, but what to do differently has and has continued to be a source of very much debate. Some proposals, like the one that you can see here, seek to protect the city's waterfront by adding features that can better accommodate flood water while also serving as an everyday amenity. Other proposals seek to keep the water out, like this rendering of a seawall that right, might run along the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Now, features like this, this, these kinds of hard infrastructural measures, could serve to protect the dense population, wealth, and economic activity of Lower Manhattan, which you can see in the upper left corner. They could also wind up displacing even more water onto parts of South Brooklyn and Staten Island. As you might have noticed, talk of adaptation tends to deploy militaristic language, attack, defend, retreat. And the dominant way of dealing with flooding has long been a combination of the first two approaches. So you attack by building even farther out onto the water and then defend existing settlements with hard engineered structures that can accommodate or protect from flooding. To retreat, to not bother with hard defenses at all, but instead to get out of the way, is far less common and far more controversial, but it's also fast becoming far more necessary. With climate change, some places are bound to become increasingly uninhabitable. Yet it's also the case that even in places with recurrent disasters, people generally do not relocate. And post-disaster policies remain geared to rebuilding homes and infrastructure in the same places they were before. And there are very many good reasons for this, as I'm sure you can think of. So I'm a social scientist. An extensive body of social science research demonstrates the impacts, the very negative impacts of forced relocation and displacement in numerous contexts, ranging from disasters to development to urban renewal. While it's relatively easy to move a physical structure, like the house in that last picture, kind of picking up and running, it's much harder to relocate communities to sustain cultures and social ties. Relocation, when it does occur, tends to be experienced as a second disaster. As we all know, places have cultural and symbolic value as well as financial value, so losing them entails multiple costs. Which is why what I saw happen on Staten Island after Sandy was so surprising. This is a photo that I took in the neighborhood of Graham Beach, one of many neighborhoods where groups of residents wound up organizing after Sandy and lobbying for government buyouts of their damaged houses. They wanted money to move, and they wanted their, name to, their land to be permanently turned back to Mother Nature, with future development prohibited. Over the weeks, months, and years after Sandy, I watched as hundreds of people came together to beg the government to, in effect, disperse their communities and to demolish neighborhoods that some of them had called home for generations. Some of these groups succeeded, and three neighborhoods have now been unbuilt, largely, but most people did not succeed in getting this funding, finding themselves stuck in places where they no longer felt safe. In their struggle for resources to adapt to climate crisis, Staten Island's far from alone. Calls for retreat have emerged in far-flung locales, from Papua New Guinea to Panama, the Gulf Coast to Alaska, many of them from indigenous communities who, unlike the predominantly white homeowners in Staten Island, are being disproportionately hit first and worst by climate change's impacts as are other communities of color and low-income communities. As thorny a challenge as decisions about how to adapt and whether and when to retreat posed in New York after Sandy, New York is one of the wealthiest cities and one of the wealthiest, in one of the wealthiest countries in the world. 
And these questions and decisions are far thornier in places whose populations are unjustly bearing the brunt of climate change, despite having contributed least to the emissions that fuel warming and to have profited the least from those emissions. So this map shows on the top the highest emitting countries and regions. So the higher their emissions, the larger they appear. Uh, on the bottom, you see the largest places that have the highest mortality due to global warming. And as you can see, these are two very different and almost inverse maps. Climate change's human impacts are being felt on what are already vastly unequal landscapes, and these are landscapes that are now also becoming vastly more unstable. Many more people in many more places will have to move and adapt, but it's critical to recognize that there are choices as to what that looks like. So who will be forced out, for instance, by rising flood insurance rates or by a seawall that helps speed gentrification in a neighborhood that it's ostensibly meant to protect? Who will be gradually displaced, potentially winding up somewhere where they're even more at risk? And who will be enabled to retreat, resettle, and move or migrate on their own terms? Across scales ranging from the very local to the global, human movements, some of them forced and some of them fought for, are emerging as just one of many pivotal issues of environmental and climate justice, leading more to ask what the responsibilities are of the countries and companies that have done the most to fuel the climate crisis and the least to stem its impacts, impacts which are only set to grow more extreme and widespread without concerted action. Depending on the answers to questions like these, it remains to be seen whether the human impacts of climate change and the human impacts of our responses to climate change, or lack thereof, contribute to sowing new kinds of conflict and further entrenching inequality, or by contrast, prove capable of giving rise to newfound solidarities, visions of communities, and to places and a planet that is both environmentally and socially sustainable. Thank you. <laughs>